I'll let Jack take it from here, and then I believe we're going to move into the fireside chat. So, thanks, guys. Hi, I'm Jack, just like the uh, name says. Uh, very <laughs> lovely to be here in Denver. Uh, so, um, I was at Google starting in 1999 and spent about six years at Google. The interesting thing about that experience is that I actually did not believe that I would spend so many years in one company. That was, that was the time when 1998, 1999, the stock market was just exploding. I, and I actually felt that I kind of missed the boat. This whole thing is over. I just work for myself, and there's no reason to join any company out there. So my, the, kind of like the plan in my head was essentially to consulting, to kind of help people with uh, their infrastructure. So and then one day, I was um, actually rollerblading in Stanford. And I was rolling around, and I saw there's like a congregation of some sort of people, tents and stuff. And when I rolled in, I saw that there was a job fair. I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, I kind of need, you know, need consulting work. So I rolled in, and I and I see a bunch of companies trying to hire. You know, there was like Altavista hiring, Yahoo was hiring. And then I see Sergey. And I originally am from Russia. Uh, immigrated in 1990. And I saw the name Sergey, and I'm like, okay, well, another fellow Russian, I'm going to maybe speak some Russian with him, and, uh, you know, to practice. And when I started to speak, try to try to go to him, he's like, I, I don't really kind of like really speak well, because he, he came to the country when he was like three years old. So we talked, and, and then I asked him, okay, so what, what is this Google all about? And like, the name's like, really, really <coughs> and silly, it makes no sense. <laughs> kind of like something that a baby would, you know, sound would make, right? So, so he says, uh, Google is this new search engine, it's really awesome, it's like it's the fastest and the best. And I'm like, well, isn't there like seven other search engines out there? Like, what's the point of having, having another one? And he said, well, we have this uh, seventh mover advantage. <laughs> <laughs> so we can improve uh, all the things that are broken with, uh, with, uh, with the other search engines. And so I asked him, okay, so how many people do you have in the company? It's all about, about 10, and they're hiring, obviously. So uh, needless to say, to say, at the time of our conversations, he did not convince me to join the company because I felt, well, they don't have any money to, to pay me, right? And besides, I'm not really looking for a job. But then I came home, and I loaded, loaded Google into a browser, and I was just you know, so impressed. It just worked. There was no broken link. No, no problems of any kind. Uh, first kids were, were not born. Um, <laughs> so I thought if this was a search engine that I would be making, I mean, that, that it would look like that. So I hopped on the phone, called them, and said, hey, Sergey, I'm the guy who spoke with you at Stanford. I'm coming in. Uh, I said, yeah, sure, stop by. So I stopped by, and uh, Larry and Sergey interviewed me. Speaking of the company's culture and their focus and vision, so the first question they asked me, uh, how do you buy computer stuff? Like, that's my thing. So I, I mentioned it's going to be, uh, there was the site called Pricewatch and Shopping.com. And, and so I, I said that, and they're like, wow, those are our like, you know, favorite sites too. We buy all of our junk there. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, uh, that's, that's great. So they said, yeah, you know, just based on that answer, we, we feel that it's a fit. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, so when I start, and I just, just come in next week. So I came in, and uh, the first day was kind of interesting. I mean, I didn't know it at the time, but it was uh, full of Stanford grads. There were like no chairs and a bunch of uh, exercise balls. And my first week, uh, I was joined by Marisa Myers and uh, Paul Bukai, who actually did the, did the Gmail. Um, and since I was like the first IT slash infrastructure person at the company, I was tasked to set up their environment, their kind of like computers and whatever laptops. <coughs> so I did that. Um, and then at the end of the day, once I got kind everything of figured out and removed all of the viruses that they uh, uh, I asked Larry, I said, so what's, uh, what should I be doing with my time? Like, what, what do you guys need uh, to do? And this, well, our search engine slows down at peak, and there were like literally maybe like 150 queries per second, not a lot, right? So they said, 
he said, your job is to make it faster. I'm like, okay, well, I have no idea what I should be doing exactly, but then he, point, he points at, at the corner of the room somewhere, it's like a pile of equipment. He's like, well, what all this stuff? I actually don't know what to do with it, but um, we hear it's good, so why don't you take it to the data center and start installing it? And, okay, that sounds like really great setup. I'll, I'll just go figure this out. So I take all this stuff, which is like a bunch of load balancers and a bunch of like faster servers, memory, put it in the car, drove to the data center. When I came to the data center, I saw this. <laughs> oh, oh, no. oh yeah, so, so he also said, by the way, your first day, you need to take delivery of 2,000 servers. And you only had 300 at the time. I'm like, 2,000 servers? I'm only one person. How am I going to install them? So when the truck showed up, it showed up with this. And that doesn't look like any server I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, in fact, what this is, is uh, what we used to call uh, a breadboard setup, the shelves without any sort of enclosure, and uh, Larry claimed it to be better for, for airflow. Uh, he later said that he was wrong. Um, <laughs> but what, uh, what you can see there are actually four servers. So like, this is a server right here, and that's a server, and there's two more at the end. So the whole thing was set up so poorly that every time I would touch it, it would just disconnect and turn off, so to get rid of power. Uh, and of course, you, you see all those cables and sharp edges. So this specific rack is called the JJ rack. Well, I labeled that rack myself. That rack happens to be in a computer history museum in Mountain View. The delivery crew rolled in all of those racks. There's like 20 of them. I'm like, okay, so I have all this equipment. How am I supposed to boot them up, right? And they're completely empty. There's like no Linux installed, nothing. So. Um, so Larry says, well, we're kind of using Red Hat, you know, here's the image that you need to do. So I'm thinking, okay, 1,000 servers, how long will it take you to install one? It's going to be crazy. So what I did, I uh, set up um, uh, a thing called uh, Kickstarter or Kickstart server. And eventually, uh, the way it would work is that I would just car on, by the way, those are the, those are the reset buttons right here. One, two, three, four. So, you would, I would go and press on them like this, and they would boot up and install themselves. So I would just run quickly across, across the row of servers, and do, 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 do. <laughs> if I didn't do it in time, uh, like those all kinds of things would happen, and uh, they would install only halfway, and have to redo this whole thing. So anyway, after about a day, they were actually all installed, and that was still really cool. So, um, the data center that we had was relatively small, it was called Exodus. And Exodus data center was in Santa Clara. Um, and it was actually the first data center that I ever needed. So I never been a data center ever. So it was, um, I actually did not have any sort of preconceived ideas how things should have been. So I thought, okay, that's, that's how they are. That's what I'm working with at the time. So anyhow, um, a few years forward, boom, wow. So what you see here is pretty much the same thing, except, you know, better. <laughs> okay. So still no, ch no enclosures of any kind, but there's tons of servers. So that was kind of cool. And uh, my work shifted from installation, and I pretty much did everything from installation far on to, to software, infrastructure, so I eventually just moved on to, to network and telecommunications. So that was my thing. Right, so disasters. Um, they happen all the time. In fact, I was probably one of the people who actually killed Google a few times myself. <laughs> and what I would do, and, and, and again, I was, I was a young kid and I was learning what, was doing, what, what not to do. So generally in a data center, you have an uplink. And of course, Google didn't think they needed two, so it was only one. So when I was installing firewalls, I accidentally applied the wrong security rule and pretty much locked myself out completely and killed Google. And you know, I pressed this enter button, right? And then I see my screen actually freeze. Yeah. Like it doesn't move anymore. And uh, my colleague sitting next to me, and I was sharing an office with uh, with Jim Reese and Larry Schwimmer at the time. You know, kind of like I kind of knew the best too. 
So Jim says, what did you do? I'm like, uh, I don't know, I just pressed the empty button right here. <laughs> Nothing seems to work anymore, but I know how to fix it. <laughs> so I ran off, uh, ran into uh, my manager's office, which was like, hey, of course, I, I think I did something wrong. I need to run to the data center real quick. But if I don't have a car, can I, can I borrow your car? So he's like, yeah, sure. So I jump in the car, drive real quick, uh, it's about 10 miles, drive as fast as I can, run to the data center, throw my driver license at the security, it's an emergency, I just need to get in. So they let me in real quick, I go into the cage, and rather than actually opening the cage, because it takes too long, I reach out through the cage's uh, kind of space, and I unplug the router, and then I plug it back in. <laughs> flushing, flushing all of the bad changes. And throughout the reboots and everything's back in my so, <laughs> so anyhow, uh, lack of visibility into operation of the infrastructure level. Well, uh, this is actually talks about like, when, when you when you grow your uh, infrastructure and you don't have proper monitoring, you just don't know what's going on or what might accidentally be broken. And there's so many uh, moving pieces. Uh, within, within the infrastructure as, as more people start to work on them, so you just have to monitor everything. So we had a lot of those issues where things are simply not monitored and we don't know what's wrong. So one of the key lessons that are in there is that you absolutely, when you deliver a new feature, the next step should be monitoring and the on-call people or operations personnel should really know, you know what to do once there's an, there's an alert that should be like part of the uh, operation culture. Reasons for disaster. So, uh, apps to operational experience, that was like totally neat. Like, I had no idea what the hell I was doing. Um, and of course, nothing like this, they teach you at school. And I am a computer science degree, but hey, I, I know how to code and whatever, it's all computers, but I had no idea how to like keep them writing. So, there's that. So, um, internal SLA, this is something that's like the teams have to agree on like what, how things should be working, how they shouldn't be working, because without that sort of SLA internally, and you know, every team is kind of like doing their own separate things and they break things. So, and operational guidelines should be written out. And that's kind of like, I mean, if, if the company makes like a few, few million dollars a year, you kind of have to have those things. So how do we avoid disaster? So it's, it's kind of a cool graphic. Uh, Twitter, we're hitting this antenna, and, and I don't know if you guys remember, back in the day, Twitter used to all the time, you know, what, what's going on, right? So with Twitter, it was actually not necessarily the operational issues, it was the, the choice of using Ruby on Rails and trying to scale it really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> it was like, oh my god, the, in fact, I would do a few things and it would be like, well, did I really do this? The whole thing's burning down, okay. <laughs> so, uh, what I want to address here is that postmortems are important. <laughs> As in, okay, you break something, then you kind of really need to think in steps. What did you do? Why did you do it? And what would you have done differently afterwards? That's so that you can learn and everybody else can learn on your mistakes. Or you can learn on somebody else's mistakes. Uh, within, within a week, they, uh, they gave me a term sheet. And I looked at it, and it was great. It was like $15 million on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on $35 million. Uh, pre, actually, yeah, pre. And I thought, yeah, that's pretty great, but but I but I looked at our traffic and we had like maybe 30 million unis or MAUs coming to the site. We were number 20 on Alexa, which was pretty awesome. And I felt that it really should be more than this. And but they would just say, okay, this is the best deal we will we will give you. We're not going to give you any more. And I, I also felt that they're giving way too much money. Like I did not want to take 15 million and give. Because you were still cash for positive. <laughs> right. It, it made no sense to do it, to give, to give away 30% of a company right at the time. So so I literally crossed the street and went to Sequoia and had a meeting there in front of their partners. And they were so fast to turn around. In fact, I drove back to Los Gatos and within two hours, the two partners came to the term sheet. Like literally. So there was a meeting at 12 and then at around 2 or 3, I had the term sheet, term sheet in my hand. And it was it was eleven million dollars on uh, on uh, on fifty five posts, which was a great deal, right? Um, and I pretty much signed it right away. Um, in hindsight, I think 
I actually should have taken more money and not at that high of a valuation. And the funniest thing about Silicon Valley show, I mean, that, that issue actually is addressed. As in, as in you know, Richard is uh, getting this, you know, a lot of interest, you know, they're trying to give him a bunch of money, and like he gets this advice from Monica, saying, hey, don't take that much money, actually take half, at half the valuation. And the idea, that, and I should have done the same, the idea there is that if your valuation is way too high, first of all, uh, if anything goes wrong, it will be very difficult to raise Series B. Right. Like very or it's going to be down. Yes. Down, down rounds are bad, your, the founders get diluted. So the other situation is that if you don't take enough money from the VC you know, firm or fund and you only give them 20%, they have a bunch of other companies that they gave money to at, at 35%. So guess who they're going to be spending time with? Not, not with you, because you know, they only own the rest of Right, so, and that was like the thing, I mean, I, I didn't really feel that they were blowing it off, but I felt that they could have been more aggressive with like getting partnerships and, you know, and kind of driving us to, to getting things done from their perspective. So, a lot of uh, startups and companies, they feel that investors should really be kept kind of like at bay, so to speak, but I think it's, it's not the right approach. I think a lot of startups do not know what they're doing, especially in the business sense. I mean, their product could be amazing. And I have seen a lot of products in the world that were actually, like, for example, we had the search engine that we were competing against at Google uh, called Tioma. And Tioma was better. They were better, but they, they just did not have enough business sense to, to, scale, to scale and to monetize and all, and all that. So and I see a lot of situations where you, know, you don't have enough guidance from VCs, they don't introduce it to the right people, and so that you miss out on certain opportunities just simply because you raised not enough money, or perhaps you were just your valuation in Series A were, were too high. So anytime I invest, my, my message to entrepreneurs usually is that choose the right partnership, give them what they want, and if and then like the treat them as part exactly exactly because and things will fall. So um, you mentioned uh, Pi Piper, uh, yeah. which is kind of, uh, it, as I look at it, version uh, 3.0 of your career, and uh, Identify yeah. is that company. And I know that we have a little bit of a clip here, if we could play that, just so that everybody kind of gets the mindset of what Identify is all about. Uh, and I'd love to ask you a couple questions there, but let's play the clip. But. Image manipulation and management used to be a burden. Now it's an advantage. Imageizer and the Image Marketplace has revolutionized the way that Tango builds product and deploys it to the world. I think we were trying to find a quick and efficient way to support uh, new interfaces in our apps. We're also trying to build images that we would use for branding and digital assets. And we were trying also to find a way to prototype new designs. Anytime we wanted to update the app with new images, we had to take over 45,000 images, recrop them or re-manipulate them, save them somewhere, and then bring it back onto the app. Now with Imageizer, we change the URL and it's done. Before implementing Imageizer, it took us a day to three days to implement any new interface that we wanted. After Imageizer, it took hours. Buying the AWS Marketplace uh, makes it really simple to evaluate software because of the one-click evaluation, uh, the simple pricing, and the uh, security you get with using something on top of the AWS ecosystem. By buying software off the AWS Marketplace, we can build product faster and hopefully bring in more revenue and help us grow as a company. So I actually have a story on how the Inventify Imageizer you know, got started. So at Imageag, I think at peak we were maybe 60 million uniques, uh, just using and we were number 11 in Alexa ranking, which was great, uh, really awesome. Um, so we had about 3 million images being uploaded uh, daily. What we needed to do is we needed to uh, show those images on different pages, show them as, uh, as thumbnails and show them on mobile, different sizes. Different sizes. So imagine uh, 3 million new files coming in like every day. So you would need to make at least 3 or 4 or 5 copies of the same images in different scales. And the problem is, is that, well, as, as the traffic ramps up and as more uploads coming in, the other problem was that, okay, so after, after a number of years, the image actually you know, existed you know, in this 
kind of hyper growth for about five or six years. So you take 365 days multiplied by 3 million, right? So that's, that's like a billion files yearly, right? So after five years, it's like five million files that are, that are master images. But then you also need to have five other versions of the same All images. Different sizes. So, so it's uh, five billion that five, right? So all of a sudden you have 25 billion files that need to live somewhere on some sort of hard drive space. And, and mind you, that was before S3, before Amazon, so we couldn't uh, really rely on the cloud infrastructure. So we had to build the uh, storage, storage, capacity, right? storage capacity. So we actually built the object storage for, for files based on, uh, on, on an open source software called HBase. And HBase actually is a clone of a big table that Google has invented for their needs. It's a, it's a key value storage that could take arbitrary binary files and so it would actually uh, store those images in, in HBase redundantly. And, and HBase grew so large it was like a thousand servers at the time, it was very difficult to manage and our team was like struggling to keep it up. So, and the biggest problem was that we have to pre-scale those images, like right. we have to generate five images for every single upload. So, and things were... It's a common problem, right? I mean, yeah. as I understand it, uh, Snapfish is one of your customers and, and there are other massive scale That's right. so photo sharing sites like Shutterfly that yeah. have this exact same problem. Right, so pretty much I would say any any uh, any product that displays media has the same issue. Like they have to be compatible with all of the money for sizes, right? And we're talking about tablets, smartphones, there are like 5,000 Android phones now with different resolutions. So how do you actually target images properly to, to, each, to each device? So before, so at the time of uh, like when I when I came up with Imagizer, I, I've been searching for a solution to do this on the fly. So in other words, rather than doing pre-scaling of images and, and you know, pre-making of those files, I thought wouldn't it be great if you had an image library and then you had clients coming in and querying those those images that they need, and the system would just make them on the fly. And I actually did not believe that it was possible because. Every software package that I looked at was too slow, it took too much memory, it would crash under load. Uh, and then I accidentally found uh, this white paper by, uh, by John Carmack, who ha happens to be a founder of, uh, of Doom and Quake, and you know, those are like iconic video games of, of, the, of the 90s, and I, and I used to play one. Um, and there, there was this kind of like seminal uh, aspect of how to scale bitmaps as you run through the 3D world, you know, things are kind of moving around and scaling and how they do it rapidly. And they came up with a way and described it how to use JPEGs to scale. And I thought, well, wait a second. We, you know, 99% of all our images are JPEGs. So what if we could adapt that? Can you tell us a little bit about the interview process and the HR process in total? for bringing on a whole bunch of people very quickly and doing it well. Sure, so for the first two or three years, Google actually had a terrible uh, interview process and everyone knew it. And there was a very good excuse, you know, as far as what, what it was. And eventually it, it was approved. But but generally, uh, Larry and Sergey would do the, would do the interview. And uh, personally. Personally, always in one, every single one, yeah. Uh, because they felt, uh, you know, the sense of ownership, they wanted to see the people first. There was a lot of emphasis given on uh, education. Uh, and what they realized in, uh, later, or a few years later, is that actually education does not play that huge of a role for people being effective. And that was interesting because, uh, um, Usually it was like, okay, you have a master's degree in computer science, therefore you're like, you're this, we have a PhD in computer science, therefore that. Uh, but in reality, a lot of the uh, you know, masters and the PhDs would not be like super compatible with the, uh, with the startup culture. Uh, in fact, I have seen a number of people simply, simply quit within a month just because they, they would think, well, this whole thing is a mess. You know, nobody really listens to me or pays attention to me the way they should. And, like a lot of attitude, so um, we kind of realized that uh, in reality it's really about people just wanting to get things done and not necessarily like throwing their credentials around. 
Is, is there something that you would correlate from a person's background or their resume specifically that you would say that would be a high factor for success at Google at that period of time? Uh, so I would say definitely experience in startups, but not necessarily like experience in, in Amazon.com. Uh, somebody from a, from a smaller company, somebody who is like flexible in their own mind, adaptable, who is not afraid to do um, things kind of like think outside the box. In fact, I have interviewed many, many, many people with Google as they were coming in on board, and my questions were, I would say, not even like most of them were not technical. They were more more like verbal questions. What would be an example? Well, the most basic question that you could ask is like. What, what, what is the weakness within yourself that you think is uh, it's like you can share? With? A lot of people just will not get that question. But there is like really, really textbook proper answer to that. But a lot of people just like. Uh, what would be the textbook answer? Or uh, what, what Google would want to hear? Okay, so say that you have to so so this this question is a kind of like we, we, we don't really look for the weakness within the person. Right? We we'll look flexibility and kind of like a creative answer. So but the standard textbook answer would be like, um, I'm not aware of my weaknesses. Is that a weakness? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like, you know, you're passing the ball back to the interviewer. And so that they, but then uh, generally my interview would start like this. I would, uh, you know, I have a potential engineer come in and I would say, okay, so, um, if you were to have the best job in the world, what would it be? Right? And a lot of people just would not even pass that question. Like they, they would be like included. They would say, okay, tell us, or they would, they would ask me, tell me what is it that I need to tell you? I'm like, no, that's not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is your mind open and uh, I want to see your creative process. Absolutely. So at one point, um, you were talking to me about how you led a team of 12 uh, super high intellect engineers, and that your boss, who's VP of engineering, yep. had 200 direct reports. Yep. Um, so, tell us about that time frame and the stresses, the kind of lessons learned associated with that configuration. Because obviously, 200 direct reports seems like it's insane. And I used to be in the military. I used to uh, be in the Air Force, and they'd say that the proper span of control is seven to nine individuals. Not to say the military gets it right, but when I hear 200, that's just over the top. Yes, so that was actually a very interesting experience. Um, and Larry Page would drive that sort of part of the company's culture. So, so what he would say, he would say, we are hiring people that are self-starters, self-managed. They do not need managers. They can just do the right thing themselves. They can self-organize. They can drive their peers. And so we were focusing on hiring kind of like self-starters, kind of like you know entrepreneurs and residents type of, type of thing. So uh, within uh, a year or so, all of a sudden we had 200 very driven, very motivated people that couldn't really work together <laughs> because they all wanted to do something you know different, and they wanted to you know to organize groups, and there was a lot of friction. So um, my team was somewhat isolated from. That's sort of the fact because for situation, simply because we were doing something that wasn't really software related or wasn't like the core function of the Google, like the plug search, we're actually doing infrastructure. And so we were able to separate ourselves from all of that sort of friction. But it was uh, very easy to observe what was happening. And now what, what lesson uh, or what takeaway would you have that you would give to other folks that were trying to scale engineering teams and to do it the right way? Or maybe you could explain tell us how Google got to be much more efficient after right. that. So. Right. right, so so after after like the, the body of 200 engineers grew to 500 people, we started to hire people that were not necessarily <coughs> driven, you know, entrepreneur types. It was just people that we needed, you know, to, to, to get things done. And so we would hire people from like very large companies like AT&T and Amazon and what have you. Um, and those people actually found the lack of management very disturbing. They were they would they would ask, well, what about my career path? Nobody's telling me if I'm doing a good job or a, or a poor job, right? So, and to us, you know, early Googlers, that was kind of like puzzling, like how we cannot know if you're doing good or bad or whatever, right? 
So if we're complaining uh, all day long how like this thing is just not scaling, and and Larry Page was like very much against the, the layers of management because he felt that uh, we're different. We're this like really cool company that like completely breaking everything all the paradigms. And we could do that because we're cool, right? It was kind of like a little arrogant at the time, so well, that's fine. I mean, he's, he's the founder. So, so he says the tone, but but ultimately he came up with a compromise. He would say, okay, well, we're not going to hire the managers because he just couldn't find highly qualified enough managers. So he hired a bunch of uh, project managers and and uh, trying to appease both groups. So there was this like initial group of self-driven people who didn't know the management of any kind. He would tell them, okay, well, those are just project managers. You don't need to listen to them. You don't report to them. They're just helping you with your schedule. And that was fine. And then the, the rest of the whatever 300 people, they'll be like, okay, well, those are the people that were actually uh, kind of like rewarded to and stuff, and they're telling us what to do. And, and for a while it kind of worked, but then uh, because of the absence of strong leadership in, in the management, uh, the kind of like the top of the company started to experience uh, kind of like the, the inability to tap in into, into the engineering by effectively. So, so quickly, or yeah, just just like literally, like we would have a meeting and we would say, okay, here's the five things we want to do like this quarter, and we just could not reach down into the engineering body because there was like no structure. So uh, within let's say a quarter, actually, Larry said, okay, well, this project management experiment, experiment is now working out. We're going to be hiring highly qualified managers, you know, computer science degrees, maybe PhDs, or and we couldn't find any because that's like actually I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I uh, understand from my previous discussions with you, the other condition was that they couldn't be from within the company. In other words, you yes. couldn't have a step up inside of Google to a leadership level. Yes. Or at least they, at one point they didn't. Um, they yeah, didn't want that, that's actually true. So the, the, the story here is that Google would refuse to promote people from within uh, into management. And the reason was is that because of the, the idea that or a concept that but for, for a number of years, you work with this like, highly driven individuals, and if, someone, if one of them all of a sudden is elevated, there would be more friction. Mm -hmm. So I actually experienced that sort of situation in <coughs> my own skin because I worked uh, you know, at this company for like three or four years now, and I did all of the kind of like director slash management duties, but I was not given the title of such. And to be honest, I never cared about that, but then at some point I'm like, well, I kind of want to be recognized at least. I mean, make some paper. It's unlikely that my job would change or my job description would change or what I do day to day. So I would go to you know my boss and say, well, what do you see me as you know, later? And he said, well, you're you're just like whatever architect type of person, but at the same time you need to manage your team. I'm like, okay, well then maybe I should be management. He said, nah, it's probably not good for you, and this and that. So I'm like, fine. Okay, it's not good to me. And, and then I actually went back to my team and said, hey, so, hey guys, uh, who do you want to be as your manager? And like, they were like a little shocked for just a second. They said, are you leaving? I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not leaving. And they, they said, well, we thought you were the director. And I'm like, well, technically I'm not, but if you guys want me to be, to be, to be one, so maybe you can write a quick note to, you know, to this person and kind of indicate your interest. And that's what happened. And I was pretty much one of the first people promoted from within um, into kind of like more of a... You know, and you told me that that was also a step towards you departing Google. Yeah, and so... Things, and I think everybody would find that a valuable story as well. So in hindsight, that was a mistake uh, for me personally because I really like to get things done and as soon as I became the manager and was kind of announced there, you know, around the company, I ended up just spending more time doing you know, meetings that were politically driven as far as what needs to be done, you know, priorities and this and that. And uh, my group started to suffer when it, when it came to actually working on execution because we, we were like, you know, we, we simply did not have enough of my time uh, managing that group. And, and I felt that I can't really be an effective manager if I don't talk to other groups. I want to do that as well. But what I realized is that talking to other groups just took all of my time. It was actually not fun. So in hindsight, I actually would, uh, uh, would not have chosen this.
So, so you started off um, roller skating by Sergey. Sergey, um, and you were employee number twenty-one. Flash forward, uh, you're there while there was eight thousand people. Right, you depart and you start in a check with right. with Sequoia. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Back. Can Can you explain what you how you essentially uh, made that transition, and also what were the kind of fundamental principles by which you let in check to scale it very dramatically that maybe were lessons learned from Google? Sure. So um, in 2005, I left Google because I felt that, and it's kind of funny, it was great working at Google. And I would like do it again, all over, all over again. And, but at the time, I thought there can, there can be so much of a good thing before you stop realizing that it's good, right? So I wanted to take myself out of that environment and, and challenge myself. And the, the next challenge would be my own company. Um, and so what I did, I actually started in a chat with my brother. And uh, he texted me or emailed me saying, hey, I want to do this image hosting company and this and that. It's going to be great. And I told him that he's crazy. There's no way to fly because uh, the bandwidth is just still too expensive, storage is expensive, there's like no way to make money. And that was like actually that, during that year, Google launched AdSense. And AdSense was paying tons of money, like every click was like generating like a dollar. So, um, so I kind of blew him off, and then uh, he called me up again and said, hey, um, I have this one server, and it's like it's dying under load, right? It's like some hosted server for $8 a month. And there's like images of being uploaded to the server, and it's kind of like an image sharing server. And it's like, I don't really know how to scale it or code it properly. Can you just take a look at it? And so I log in into that server, and I see just tons of traffic. I never expected it to be like so popular. So cool. I'm like, well, this is actually very interesting. So, uh, so I tweaked it, and it became like five times faster. But then three days later, it ran out of capacity. So we needed to add another server. So without really thinking twice, uh, we started scaling this sort of project that we called Image Shack. It wasn't really a company at the time, but it was literally a single file that would receive uploads and it would generate URLs for the file that hosted. Uh, just one PHP file called, called index.php, that's all there was to be. I mean, there was no other files. In fact, we, we were not really PHP coders. I mean, then you have one button called browse. You select your image, you upload, get the URL that you can post it as well. So um, then, I mean, I was already thinking about leaving Google, and I, I, and I left, and I started working on the image hack. And it's interesting that within, within the first month, we made $300. And our, our burn was like $80. <laughs> so I'm like, I did this like calculation. So it's a sophisticated calculation in my mind. I took the 300 and then subtracted 80. <laughs> and, and I'm like, so what, what is it like if you like multiply 80 by uh, whatever? You can actually get a pretty good rate. So I'm like, well, what if you multiply by 1,000? Right? Well, wouldn't that be great? And, and I figured, hey, well, let's try it. So, um, so AdSense was there. So people would upload images, would get a little ad. and get their URL and post it elsewhere. So as URLs were posted around the internet, uh, that sort of feature and functionality actually act as self-advertising. So imagejack.com URLs were everywhere, on every forum, on every blog, on eBay, pretty much everywhere. In fact, if you search for keyword imagejack in Google, you'll get like millions of hits still. So that will drive the traffic back to the site and we would just make more and more money like every month, like we, the revenue was quadruple, and traffic was just running away, and I just keep adding servers. You know, the first month it was like 10 servers, the next month it was 30, and the month later it was like 100, and I started calling uh, to kind of like different service providers, and hosting providers, and like you know around uh, around the world, trying to to get the best, to get better capacity, better, better, better capacity. And how about the the human? How about the the team? How did you select the first people that came on board? And, Know, how did the team take shape? Or, or so, so interestingly, interestingly enough, I still felt that it was a kind of like a project in the basement, not a real company, <laughs> until we we hit 
$2 million in revenue. And I'm like, well, wait a second, it's only two of us, we're making $2 million. Shouldn't we be scaling this, like not just on, on, the, on the technological level, but more on the, on the company level too? And there was like another company called uh, Photobucket, actually, that was born here and then started to compete with us, and uh, there was like a lot of friction. And I saw that they're raising money, they're scaling, they're hiring people, and they're just getting more traction simply because they're, they're a real company, they're just a project. So I, uh, I started uh, shopping for VC money in, uh, in late 2007, um, which was the, the good time to do it. The stock market was still all-time high, and it was just before the big crash or the big downturn. 